My topic or our topic just now is the osteomyelitis, uh, but post-trauma. There is the osteomyelitis in, in children, uh, hematogenous, that's another thing. It's um, osteomyelitis um, after trauma, kind of trauma, road traffic accident, but, but might be a, a trauma of surgery too. too. And uh, focused on the tibia. So you might think it's a narrow uh, subject, a narrow theme, but it plays a, a significant role because the, uh, the, the tibia is very often uh, um, uh, involved in the fractures. And the, the patient um, we speak of may arrive on your operation table hours or even days after the accident. It uh, depends on the infrastructure and on the uh, distance to the referral hospital. Um, and um, it's rather clear what you have to do. It's uh, the um, cleaning of the wound, bringing down of the uh, bacterial load, rinsing, uh, cleansing and irrigating and uh, debriding, that means cutting off the parts which are, um, which are really dead. There, uh, there you, you should be thrifty, not to cut too much because you can be in need of any um, coverage for the remaining bare lying bone and that should be one target in this first gesture to cover any bone, to cover any vessel and nerve. These are the three vulnerable uh, structures. We do that under uh, antibiotic coverage, but just for a very short uh, term. And usually it is recommended third generation uh, cephalosporin. And we do the immobilization with the kind we have. Next one, please. Gold standard would be an external fixator. Um, if you dispose of it, there are many kinds of it. Here are some examples. And, but there are other uh, kinds of um, immobilization. You don't have the perfect reduction. You don't need to have the perfect reduction, but the axis and the rotation should be okay. And no primary closure of the wound, of, of course. And think of uh, covering these vulnerable structures. Next, please. The gold standard external fixator needs a daily care. And uh, as soon as um, the um, soft tissue coverage is closed, as uh, the, the, the wound, the skin coverage is uh, everywhere continuous, you switch from the external fixator to another external fixation. Might it be a Sarmiento cast or other kind of cast? And then you make sure that the external fixator devices find back their way to the hospital and not serve as a means to beg for the former patients like this, like this picture from Kigali shows where these former patients live with their fixators for months or even a year. Go on. And the coverage of the bare lying bone, that's mandatory. If not so, it dries out and it gets a sequester. And um, for the proximal, for the proximal uh, part and the middle part of the tibia, you can easily um, uh, do it by a, a muscle flap, for instance, which is not so uh, difficult to perform. Uh, uh, gastrocnemius or soleus for the distal gap, for the distal injury, it will be difficult to find an appropriate and vital uh, flap. There are other means. Go on. <clears throat> Here is a, a sketch on the right side, a sketch of the lower limb, and we'll uh, take the medial gastrocnemius or the soleus to cover the um, neighboring parts of the tibia. And on the right side, we see the natural f feature, the, the anatomy of the lower limb. 
and exposed after a decloving uh, injury with an open fracture. Go on. And for those, mm, for those uh, injuries where we cannot uh, attain um, uh, uh, coverage by viable um, uh, tissue, we remember, we, we, we think of uh, uh, Garden of Pergamon, that was the physician of the um, gladiators in Roman Colosseum. He already knew any tissue healing needs a moist environment. And uh, it should be assured that the wound, and maybe if, if the bone is uh, lying bare, the bone is moist, is damped 24 hours a day, and uh, that with normal saline. And for that, we don't rely on the, on the staff, on the nurse, but we rely on the well-informed patient. We give him a syringe, we give him the normal saline, and he will be mostly motivated to do everything to get his injury healed. Go on. We have in the remote hospital um, several um, means, several, um, yeah, several uh, <coughs> drugs and, and uh, uh, means, uh, and we have uh, several other means from the high technological world in Europe and America, not. We have uh, the normal saline, we have sugar and honey. And already 3,500 years ago in the papyrus of the Egyptian doctors is uh, de described how an infectant wound can be treated with a honey uh, dressing. It's useful, useful in our days too. There are other uh, descriptions how are treated open fractures for instance, Winnet Orr uh, describes it with a closed cast. He leaves closed for at least one week, and once a week he changes it from the Spanish uh, Civil War. We don't um, dispose of uh, means for segment transport, and uh, all, all these things you see on the, on the left side, we don't. Now I want to present you two cases. The case number one is a 50-year-old woman two years ago she suffered a closed uh, fracture of the lower bone fracture of the tibia and fibula closed it, at first it was treated with an external fixator maybe because of the swelling and after the swelling went down then it, uh, they switched from the external fixation to the internal fixation with a plate and screws and by doing that probably they cut this third fragment you see in, in the middle, you see here, they cut it off the blood supply and it turned into a sequester and uh, was origin to a daily discharge of pus for two years. But fortunately, in the meantime, there was forming a bridging callus on the dorsal side. So the stability was achieved, but not the that's fine, thank you. There's the sequester, the dense bone. Yeah? And there's the bridging callus, of course. Um, and our, our target was to get rid of this sequester and to curate the, this cavity so to have the bone like this. That was uh, after the intervention. So first attack, we... Yeah, go on. We did the um, uh, sequestrectomy under the third uh, generation cephalosporin. And um, later on, during this first intervention, we have taken the swab. We got the result afterwards because it's no use to take the swab from the exit of the fistula. There you have all this uh, uh, fancy. Um, kinds of, of germs, but from the depth of the wound, you need to, uh, to take it. And there was a, uh, the Escherichia, a highly resistant and an extended spectrum, lactamase producing enterobacteria. Yeah. 
Um, and um, only amikacin and uh, the kappa pen m derivatives were um, uh, efficient. And then there was an anaerobic. And uh, for the first uh, attempt, we uh, did this uh, sequestrectomy and we disposed of a gendermycin chain. We put it in, hoping that the high local concentration of this gendermycin uh, would do the job. But that was an error. The drainage continued, it did not heal. And so we, were, we, we had to do the second step, reopen the wound, do a new carotid, remove the biofilm, remove the, the chain, of course. And this time, bring in something biologically active. And that is a, a flap, a muscle flap from this gastrocnemius, the medial head. Sometimes the muscle is rather short, and sometimes it's quite long. And that's a patient, that's a picture from another operation, another patient. There we have taken this muscle flap, which takes its, its origin here behind the knee and comes down, is bent here, and is brought up to the patella to fill uh, there a gap. But as well, you can use it for the tibia. It shows you the, the range of possibilities. And um, in the two weeks following that intervention, we uh, surrounded a gross swelling, but no tenderness, no pain, <coughs> no heat. And uh, the ultrasound showed us here the muscle flap, here the bone surface, and a certain halo of fluid around. But the, then the swelling came down. There was no real ex excessive leukocytosis. And so in the very end, it, it healed very well and solid. And this problem was solved. Next patient I want to um, present is a 40-year-old woman who had sustained a road traffic accident one year ago with both legs, Gustilo 3A, open fractures. Was in several hospitals and at home. And uh, after one year, she uh, was brought to our hospital and um, <coughs> admitted. And here we see both um, uh, bare lying bones, dead bones, dead uh, parts of the tibia. Uh, so infected non unions, both sides, plus uh, covered, of course, non infected, a covered uh, non union of the forearm. What was our, th these are the detailed pictures of the right leg with the non-unions, of the left leg with the non-unions. What was our um, plan to do? We, we didn't want to, um, to do the osteosynthesis of the forearm as long as there was a heavy um, <coughs> bacterial burden of the, both bones. So at first, clean both bones means uh, debridement and enhancing the growth of a, of a granulation rug so where we could put on a split skin graft. We uh, did so uh, and when doing the debridement we, uh, we, we tried a reduction, there was just two degrees uh, of uh, of reduction possible, and we uh, assured that, ensured that with uh, external fixators. And then we applied the method of Galen, the continuous irrigation done by the patient herself. And yeah, that was the plan we, we wanted to pursue. Uh, and here we see the left leg on administration, on, on admission and after three weeks. In the meantime, debridement and damping. The right leg admission, in the meantime, debridement and this treatment of garden. Then we put on the um, split skin grafts and once the um, wound was covered with skin, 
we suggested that um, the, the bacterial burden had come down. And then we dared to do the osteosynthesis of the forearm, that was okay. And then we, uh, step four, we did what we could do to stimulate the uh, callus formation of the non-union for by, by decortication and application of bone chips from the iliac crest. And we, we didn't want to do that, go back, we di didn't want to do that by, thank you, by a direct approach because there, there was a quite uncertain coverage by the split skin graft, but to sneak there under cover through, uh, through the posterolateral lateral approach. It's a, a, an unusual approach, but a, a very recommendable approach. You go uh, behind the peroneus compartment, you uh, sneak along the posterior uh, periosteum of the fibula, the dorsal face of the membrana interossea, you reach the dorsal part, the non-affected and non-infected part of the tibia, and there you do the decortication with the chisel and you apply your bone chips. And all this uh, is well covered by this muscle pack. You don't meet the nerve branch, uh, branches, you don't meet the, the vessels of the tibialis artery and uh, the per peroneus nerve uh, branches are anterior. So we did so and um, two weeks later we encouraged the patient to stand up and to walk. First time after one year with this support, she still wears the both uh, um, uh, external fixators and um, okay, that was that's the story. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. One minute remains. Okay, so I show the other um, pictures. So uh, until now, that was a happy story. But then there's uh, the less happy story. You remember this um, this picture, the anatomy. But uh, that was not uh, just for showing you the anatomy. That was the consequence of a road traffic accident. And uh, this day, I thought, oh, uh, how happy you have a nice flap. You cover up all this fracture side, and then you uh, mount this um, external fixator. No problem. I, I, I did not close per primary intention this wound, but I attached the uh, wound rims so to be sure that the bone would not lie bare. And I was so optimistic that it would um, heal. But um, it was an HIV patient and then you remember the impact of the energy which broke the bone went on this soft tissue. So the soft tissues were compromised too and that is, yeah, what a pity, that is after six weeks the picture. HIV positive, so maybe what? Okay, I thank you.